Failures can be minimized, but not eliminated. Learn how AVSs are helping make drone crashes virtually harmless with parachute recovery. Welcome to session number 15 of NestGen 22, Parachute Recovery Systems for Safe Flight Over People. To give you some context before I hand it over to our uh, speaker here today, um, I am often imagine a, a day when I look outside my window and see several drones flying over me, delivering packages, monitoring road traffic, preventing and fighting fires, spraying seeds, and whatnot. In reality, there's a lot that needs to go behind the scenes to make that happen. As Deeraj pointed out in our keynote address, there needs to be a wide set of contingencies that we account for while building an autonomous system. It goes without saying that fail-safes aren't set in place with the belief that things won't work, but rather to avoid situations that aren't under our control to affect us negatively. We need to essentially give the system the flexibility to adapt to different situations, enabling it to function without human intervention. AVS is uh, drone parachute recovery system or BRS and flight termination system have been proven to be some of the most reliable fallback mechanisms designed to reduce the risk and downtime related to flight failure. Their PRS is equipped with internal sensors that continuously monitor flight conditions in real time, autonomously deploying a parachute when a failure is detected. With backup options such as manual control and alarms, the system is designed for high safety and compliance with civil aviation authorities. AVSS is part of a global network of drone technology stakeholders that have welcomed the uh, requirements for third-party testing and validation for PRSs. To speak more about this, of course, we have co-founder and CEO Josh Ogden. He is a graduate of the University of New Brunswick, a serial entrepreneur and a peer-reviewed published author. Before helping start Aerial Vehicle Safety Solutions in 2017, Josh worked as a technology and regulatory management consultant with a diverse group of early and mid-stage technology companies. At AVSS, Josh is responsible for leading the long-term vision of the company and assisting the engineering team with building products that meet the current and future regulatory needs. Josh is also a member of several drone industry-related groups, including the several ASTM F-38 committees and the Canadian RPAs R&D task group. Thanks so much for being here with us today, Josh. Over to you. I Thank you very much for having me you. in the introduction. Thank you very much for joining us today. Hopefully it's not too early, not too late for everyone. Um, so again, my name is Josh Adam, the CEO of AVSS. We started this company in 2017 with the simple question of what happens when a drone fails. Um, one thing to, to recognize over the last couple of years, safety has become a key component of any flight over people or beyond visual line of sight. And that's where Jake Stokey says it great. The drone pa parachute revolution is here. And why? Because of safety. Regulators want an environment where safety is considered and there's redundancy systems built in and today's session so today we'll be just doing a brief overview about avss we're going to discuss why we would use a parachute and then we're going to go into key features of a parachute from there we're going to end with going into some practical but nitty-gritty insight of the parachute recovery systems in some different markets such as uh, the united states and europe um, so about avss AVSS started in 2017 and is now a global distributor of parachute recovery systems. We have more than 50 authorized dealers selling our product across the world. Um, we are also, uh, our product is compliant with the third party standard ASTM F3322. This is a compulsory test for flight over people in many of the countries. And this requires crashing a drone 45 times to demonstrate the performance of the system. We've done three ASTMs. And we've actually got three more scheduled for the spring. I think by then we'll have the most ASTMs completed in the world. Some of our customers who are using our product to enable more are telecom providers, construction companies, and public safety as well. We have a host of high-end dealers such as Adorama Global Flight, RMUS, and Advexture selling our product. Um, additionally, for the M300 in the Canadian market, for example, we are the number one choice with 85% of the market. And we see that similar representations in other markets such as Europe. Um, recently and excitingly, we get to announce a new product that we uh, are launching and received a contract. This is a guided parachute system, which I'll actually be discussing towards the end of the conversation. And then, so why use a PRS, a parachute recovery system? You know, when we speak to drone manufacturers or end users, it's a really common theme that, you know, there's, there's been a lack of trust with the parachute manufacturers historically because of their robustness and their 
performance as well. It's an expensive item that adds weight. So ultimately, why are you gonna use something that's gonna reduce your flight time? The key thing to understand is the regulatory environment. As I hinted to at the start, civil aviation authorities have recognized that drones are coming, especially since, since COVID. However, safety is paramount. They don't want things falling out of the sky. So our product is enable, an enabling technology to reduce the kinetic energy and help with people flying beyond visual line of sight and operations over people. For example, in Canada, if you were to buy the DJI M300 or the DJI M200 and you wanted to use it for over people, you wouldn't be allowed. However, if you add in AVSS, the modifier, as you can see on the screen here, you're suddenly enabled to fly over people under the advanced category. And the reason for this in the Canadian market is a single source of failure cannot cause the drone to come down and the kinetic energy thresholds. Um, and some examples, some practical examples. So this is a customer of ours called Altamax. They are a DJI dealer as well as a, a service provider for offshore and oil and gas, um, as well as utility. They were doing a mission across Newfoundland where they were counting utility poles and they were going in the backyards of residents. And to do that in Canada, they would need a parachute recovery system for that flight over people. Additionally, in Canada, we have an example at the uh, 108th Grey Cup. So this is the Canadian Football League, our lesser version of the NFL. However, during this event, um, typically you're not allowed to have drones flying over. However, with a parachute recovery system and in Canada, what we call an SFOC, a special flight operator certificate, there the customer Mohawk College, as well as the Hamilton Police, they were able to put an M300 above the crowd during this um, public event with nearly 20,000 people. Another example is Volatis Aerospace. They are a company that is across North America and I believe South America, and they were doing some beyond visual line of sight operations across Canada. And for them to be enabled and approved to do that, again, a parachute recovery system for that extra redundancy, the extra safety for the regulator. Um, another example that we see parachute recovery systems being used is drone as a first responder in the United States. So it's Shula Vista, very well-known public safety organization. They have um, drones on their roof that are operating seven days a week, 10 hours a day. And they are a customer who are using parachutes to receive their COAs, their certificate of authorization waivers. And then finally in Europe, what we're seeing is uh, our first light UAS certificate approval in Hungary. This is GeoLayer. Their approval allows them to do their own risk assessments and enables them flexibility in the European Union to go and fly and control it. And again, a parachute recovery system being a key component to that aspect. Um, and so now after talking some use cases, I'm gonna discuss some key features of a parachute recovery system. We find that a lot of end users and even manufacturers aren't fully aware of all the feature sets and don't understand that, you know, a parachute recovery system isn't just, you know, a parachute that's going to deploy out. There's a lot more features in, in engineering in it. And, and to start off, a key thing with a parachute recovery system is ASTM F3322 compliance. So there's a lot of misinformation out there on what is the third party standard, who can do it and how is it validated. There's a new ASTM standard actually being published in the next 60 days. However, with this standard, what we under, need to understand is it requires 45 crashes. The new standard, there'll, there'll be an increase of 10 or 15 more tests. However, you're demonstrating that your system is reliable. And in this testing, we're, we're checking for single motor failure. We're checking for full motor failure. We're also doing shock load tests to validate that everything stays together. And one thing, unfortunately, and I think this plagues the drone industry is some companies have gone out and tried to find a rubber stamp testing agency, someone who can just say they passed the test without a proper accreditation. And this is why we use an FAA designated test site in New York called New Air. And this validates, and this is important um, for the new standard that's being approved and, and launched the next 60 days or the revised standard that is, is that third party test sites are gonna be scrutinized more. Regulators have been burnt already when companies go out and try to circumvent the, the spirit of the, of the standard. And this is where the standards are becoming more robust, which ultimately for the end user and for other drone manufacturers, this means you should be validating and questioning who did your testing? Can I see the report? If they're not willing to share the report and share the details, I'd be very skeptical. And so again, I think that's a very paramount feature for parachute recovery systems when we think of flight over people and beyond visual line of sight. Next, it key features is a bracket design. One thing that we 
grapple with as a parish recovery system company is we're not the primary. We're, you know, we're somewhat second class citizens. And because of that, we want to make sure that we're out of the way of the key sensor. So if you have a top payload for the M300, you know, let's not use that real estate. Let's give that to you. However, your, your bracket needs to be strong enough to handle an opening shock test. So during the third party testing, you need to actually drop the drone for, for three seconds. It's going to approach terminal velocity. The parachute's going to open. There's going to be a lot of opening shock. And so if you don't design your bracket appropriately, it's not going to work. Additionally, you need to think about the end user. The end user doesn't want to be sitting there using a bunch of tools to set up and, and tear down every time. So there's some usability there. So, so a bracket is a key component where is it easy to use and did it, did it withstand the third party testing? Next is a flight termination system. This is a topic that seems to be a lot of confusion in Europe um, and the other markets, it, it seems more straightforward. However, with a flight termination system, the ultimate goal is to stop the propellers. And you wanna stop the propellers for two reasons. One is to avoid entanglement. You don't wanna ca get caught up in the actual parachute. Additionally, you wanna make sure that you don't cause laceration. So when the drone comes down and if it were to hit somebody, you do not want the propeller spinning. Now to do a flight termination, there's a couple options. And so on the left-hand side of the photo, you can see uh, an external hardware FTS for the TB55 batteries for the DJI M200. This is cutting the power between the battery and the drone. And then on the right-hand side, you see a software FTS for the M300 that we also provide that is actually sending a, what they call a kill command through the DJI OSDK. So again, with the flight termination system, some regulators are, are happy with the software FTS, some require hardware. So there is, depending on countries that you're in and their understanding of the flight termination system. Next is the auto trigger. So an automatic triggering system isn't just simply you know, a gyroscope that, you know, you flip over and the drone fails. That's really simplistic and you can result in false positives. You want a, an automatic triggering system that is independent of the drone and that provides you as the end user or manufacturer also insight into why a failure happened. On the screen here, you see an M300 that has failed and you can see around the, the middle of the circle, that's the main, minor, the majority of the flight envelope. However, as you exceed the green, which we call soft thresholds, which we start analyzing because, you know, maybe your drone tilts a little bit over. However, it, it, it corrects itself. Well, that's not a failure. So that's what we call soft thresholds. And then a red, the red is when it completely flips over. And as you can see here, here's a real life example of a failure. Um, next, we're going to discuss the actual practical nitty gritty. So one thing with parachute recovery systems, Yes, it can be there to help save your drone. It's not guaranteed. If you land your drone on a concrete or on some rough surfaces, things are probably gonna break. So again, if someone tells you from a parachute company, 100% guarantee the drone's in perfect shape, I would be questioning that. Um, but there is some really nitty gritty details that I'll be discussing for each country and looking at you know what does it actually mean? So to start off in the FAA, so the USA, there's a lot of confusion on how you get to flight over people. The rules were implemented and we're starting to see progression under the part 107 rules, but we're not quite there yet because of category two and three um, requirements. And that first requirement is means of compliance, which no, no means of compliance has been approved yet. That involves a parachute recovery system for flight over people. We've got one submitted our own custom means of compliance. That'll be, we believe it's three to nine months away. I'm waiting on the FAA and I believe they were waiting on the new third party standard. But a, a key thing to understand is in the United States, it isn't 11 foot pound or 25 foot pound of kinetic energy. It's the severity comparison. And that's something that I think a lot of people miss. You're not looking in like Canada and Europe where you're doing a kinetic energy formula. What's your descent rate? What's the mass of the object? And typically you're around, you know, 60, 70 joules, which is, you know, around 50 foot pound. But in the United States is we actually have to do additional testing, which we call ATD testing for the comparison injury to a rigid object. So what you see here is um, some screenshots of our ATD testing system. And what it is, is you're taking the drone, it, you're sending it into the ATD the crash test dummy. You're looking at the data on what injuries, you know, neck compression, for example, occurred. And then on the right, you have a rigid object, which has certain specs that you have to meet. And you're looking at what were the injury comparisons. And if the injury of the drone were less than the injuries of the rigid object under either CAT 2 or CAT 3, you are then compliant. And there's a couple more steps to do, but ultimately this is the key point for the means of compliance. And so if I'm a drone manufacturer, 
not only am I looking at the descent rates, I'm also looking at, well, what, what's my drone made out of and what's, you know, plastic versus metal. So what am I going to create for injuries? And this is something that, you know, the U.S. is leading on and is more robust than other countries, which does add additional costs, but it, it gives you initial insight into your drone. Um, next is for the DNR, durability and reliability testing. So in the United States, there's four categories, category one, two, three, and four. Ca I just spoke about category two and three, category ones for smaller drones, but then there's category four. This is a rather um, new development in the United States when they originally launched the rules for flight over people, this wasn't included, but once they received comments during the uh, notice period, they did actually introduce a category four. This is for type certification. So the philosophy around type certification is if you have more data on the reliability of a system, your drone, for example, and you meet certain flight hours, the severity of injury is allowed to be higher because the likelihood is less. And this is where category four comes in and, and something that's quite often overlooked by drone manufacturers who are entering into the type cert world is that a parachute recovery system can actually reduce your time to market. So as you can see on the two columns, on the left-hand side, your hours, for example, if you want to fly in a rural area is 375. But if you want to fly with a parachute system that's ASTM approved and the kinetic energy is less than 128 foot pound or 170 joules, you can actually reduce it from 375 to 150 hours. And another example is, you know, in San Francisco, which is, we would say, a, a population density of 20,000 per square mile, you're going from 7,200 flight hours to 3,600, which is a considerable saving when you consider what that per hour cost is. And again, this is something that's quite overlooked by a lot of drone manufacturers just because of the process to get into the actual durability and reliability testing. Next in Europe. So with Europe, why does a parachute and flight termination system matter? Well, for PDRAs, the predefined risk assessments under the specific category. And one thing that's required, for example, near airports is you need a flight termination system so that your drone doesn't leave your operational area, but you also need a parachute for human factors. So one thing that, that you know, we believe is, is quite clever and, and quite um, intelligent by the European Union was they recognize that you know, some pilots don't want to just have their drone fall out of the sky because it's leaving the area. They might, they might hesitate, they might delay. So they included that parachute system to provide, you know, well, at least you might not lose your complete drone. Now that's not guaranteed. As I said, you know, during third party testing, we see, you know, half the drones come out with no damage and then, you know, 40% with some damage and, you know, you're going to lose a couple drones during these 45 crashes. However, the regulators recognize that maybe it will help these end users be more inclined to make sure their drone doesn't leave that operational environment. Next is ground, ground uh, risk class. So this is where I'm excited to talk about our new product that we've been working on. So when you're flying your drone and using a SOAR application, there's a ground risk buffer rule. And right now the rule is a one-to-one. -one. From our third-party testing and data collected, that actually isn't accurate. It's, it's more of a one-to-two which means if you're at 100 meters, you should anticipate almost, almost a 200 meter drift with you know, a parachute that can't be guided. And so we've actually got real life examples where during our third party testing for the M200, you know, as you can see on the right, we were at 120 meters. And when we deployed, it exceeded and it drifted to 197 meters. So what that means is if you're flying BV loss over people, you should be accounting for this as well we're recognizing that the JARS rules need to be updated for the one-to-one -one rule with unguided parachute systems. But then comes the question on what happens if you could guide it? And that's where our announcement on our recent contract with Indigenous Services Canada and Transport Canada for our guided parachutes is an exciting part because we'll be launching later this year a new product where we can actually control where the parachute drifts after deployment. So what does that mean? That means you can control your ground risk buffer zone and reduce it. So in the green is an example of us being able to control it a one to 0 0.5. So if I'm at hundred meters, being able to control it within 50 meters, which is a huge opportunity when we look at the drone delivery market for urban cores. Um, for example, this is an example in Japan of a drone delivery route um, that 7-Eleven is doing that they announced in December. And when you take a look, the red is the true the uh, drift area that if you were to use a unguided parachute it deploys this is how far it could drift out to but the the yellow is the rs rule which again we don't agree with because of data supporting that it will drift farther and green is the new guided parachute system that we've developed so we believe that this is an example of an evolution in the drone industry that we're going to be seeing um and we've seen 
he asked to talk about steerable parachutes for a larger system. And we think that this is going to become status quo in the drone industry. Um, thank you very much for attending today. Uh, I know that's a lot of information on regulations and getting into some of the details. So happy to answer any questions, or if you'd like to send me an email, feel free to email me at josh.ogden at avss.co. Great. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, that was quite a lot of information. Yeah, it's on our way. So let's just wait for a couple of minutes. Um, I guess our audience would like to ask a few questions. We have a few uh, on our social media channels and on Discord. But I'll just wait for a little bit longer in case people want to ask questions. Until Perfect. then. Oh, I and I'm just going to throw up a video here. Great. Yeah, that would be great. And I can show our new our, our guided parachute system. So here's an example of us doing some drops. So again, our use case for this technology um, initially we'll be doing medical delivery in northern Canada. Um, this is an area where it's hard to reach. There's no available infrastructure for existing drone delivery. So they want a system that can do uh, critical medical supplies. Uh, without having to invest in the expensive infrastructure. So this is giving them an option and showing some landing accuracy of, of uh, critical items. This also has applications for wildfire, for um, military and other applications. Interesting. And the Sorry, reason actually for this development was starting in 2018, we started noticing our drones were drifting into trees and power lines, and we wanted to reduce that risk. And so we started working on the control algorithms that autonomously direct the system straight to a predefined GPS point. And again, I can just replay that video out. If there's any questions, feel free to put it into the chat. Happy to answer. Or again, you can email me at josh.ogden at avss.co. So You mentioned that you allow um, you don't you don't want to interfere with uh, when when people want to add payloads, for example, on top of interstate grade drones like the M three hundred. Now, when you're encountering a failure, right? Like, how do you prioritize? Um, so typically, so when we when we design the bracket, our goal is for it to land as close as possible to on the feet, um, and so that's kind of the trade off. Sometimes manufacturers will ask, well, can we land it upside down? That, sure, that's an option. However, you must be aware that your third-party testing is going to be quite expensive if you're always landing your drone upside down. Okay. And then I can okay. share a video of our uh, main in-market system for the M300. Uh, so this is the uh, a single motor failure, actually. So you'll watch the drone here. It'll start spinning out of control. And then the parachute will yes. deploy. Excellent. Okay. So we're starting to get questions as well. Perfect. Great. So uh, one of our questions is also around the uh, M300. They've asked how much weight and height do your solutions add to a drone like the M300? So the weight is 900 grams. You're going to lose about 10 to 15 percent of your flight time as well as height, I assume you mean minimum deployment altitude. So that's an interesting topic that um, our system has worked at 15 meters. However, the third party testing um, standard has a requirement for a minimum deployment altitude calculation, which is based on your outlier. So if you do 45 tests, you get your average kinetic energy, your descent rate. However, for minimum deployment altitude, whether it's hover or full forward, you look for your outlier which then set rates your minimum deployment altitude. One thing with that we've brought up is that if I'm in a hover state versus a full full forward state, the way in which my parachute reacts is different. And we believe that there's a revision that will be required so that if you're in your hover state, for example, delivering a package, that your minimum deployment altitude should be rated based on the hover tests, not on the full forward tests. So that is kind of just some inside information on some, some issues with the current standard. Interesting. Uh, so they have a, uh, there's a question on how the guided PRS works and how it's controlled. Is it yeah, so the guided PRS system is similar to a paraglider where you're pulling the lines of the parachute. 
and it's controlled via GPS. So you set a GPS coordinate, the sensor suite inside knows where that target is and aims the uh, the parachute, the para, parafoil towards that target. Okay. And so how would you manage missions in GPS constrained environments? So we're, we're working denied? on some technology with uh, that'll work in, not, in GPS denied environments, but that'll come out at a later date. Okay. Do you, do you fly RTK GPS? Uh, depends on the drone. You don't have to. Uh, we have, you know, on the M210 RTK, we have customers flying with the RTK and customers without. So it really depends on the end user. But we would adapt when we integrate in different drones. We make sure that all the full features are available to the best of our ability. Okay. Okay. You spoke a little bit about uh, severity comparison, uh, comparing injury to a rigid object. And could you uh, tell us a little bit more about how uh, that's different across countries? Um, is that defined differently? Do they have different um, thresholds to that? We have someone who missed the earlier part of the session. So yes. Curious. Yeah. So in most countries, it's the kinetic energy formula. It's, you know, you look at the mass of the drone and you look at the descent rate and it creates a certain amount of joules or foot pound. That's common in, in Canada and Europe where you're seeing typically, you know, 70 to 80 joules of acceptance. However, in the States, one thing the FAA commented was that they've observed data where the DJI Phantom could create 120 foot pounds of energy, but still only create injuries under 11 foot pound. So the FAA came up with uh, using a comparison. It's a very, it's a more complicated system. Um, it provides benefit for those drones with a lot of foam, I guess, around it. But ultimately, what it's looking at is 11 foot pounds of a metal object is going to create X, Y, Z injuries. And a drone coming in at the descent with your parachute is going to create X, Y, Z injuries. If those injuries on the drone under a parachute are less than that of the rigid object, they deem it safe. So this is something that they announced the means of compliance. It's coming. Um, each company can submit their own. We started working on it in 2020. And you know, our documentation package is a 200 page documentation and it took a year and a half to build out. So it's not something that you can just go do. And I've seen some videos online where people are trying to just like drop objects and, and it's quite a scientific process. You know, the people that we're working with on this, our partners, they um, test military helmets, bicycle helmets. And, and it's something that you just can't go do on your own. Like it's a full um, system and there's a lot of right. biomedical engineering behind it. Interesting. Hmm. Any um, other questions? I think I have one other question. Um, what are the hardware oriented fail safe mechanisms have you experimented with? How do they rank up against a PRS? What do you mean I mean, hardware orientated? Uh, so I suppose this is mostly a, a bracket system that deploys the parachute and so yeah so we use a, we, similar fail, fail safe yeah we use a high-end uh compressed spring that has about 30 joules of energy and 12 inches in full extension that protects the line as well as it ensures that the parachute goes beyond the tumble zone um we've we've worked with pyrotechnics we think that for the larger drones you know when you're up to 20 25 kg a pyrotechnic solution is probably preferred option just because of the weight of the parachute and the size of spring to create that energy. However, for the smaller drones, we're a fan of the spring because of the travel the ability to travel. We have a lot of customers who are getting on planes and they don't want to deal with pyrotechnics as well as shipping when we're sending to our other dealers. So, you know, when you see a pyrotechnic solution, I, I would say that's more favored for like, you know, 20, 25 kg, maybe beyond visual line of sight kind of drone delivery applications but if you're looking at end users who need to get up and go like the m300 a work tool you don't like a pyrotechnic just adds complexity to your life and your life's complicated enough with all your batteries so we don't think you need to add more problems by using a pyro for the smaller drones okay and what about a buoyancy option in in addition to the pr system have you considered that yeah we've looked at airbag type solutions the problem with that is Drones are very weight sensitive. You don't want to add too much weight to anything. And so it would be a nice to have, but the frequency in which you use your parachute, hopefully never to add that extra additional weight 
it, it's something that can be considered. And, you know, if someone really wanted it, we could entertain it. But it's something that I think at the end of the day, it's nice in theory. But when you look at the cost and the weight of the system, you would be kind of saying, well, do I really need that? It's, it's kind of a it's a nice to have, I would say, and, and not in most cases. Right. OK, so um, there's a question on whether the PRS recovery destination is sequentially updated during a flight, whether it's dynamically updated. Yes. Uh, you mean the uh, the guided system? It, it doesn't mention um, whether it's. Yeah, like if, by updating like our, our automatic triggering system in our drone is, is constantly monitoring your flight in real time. Um, we've actually looked into using different uh, satellite and 3G, 4G technologies to uh, to enable um, live tracking. We did a Beyond Visual on Site project in 2018 on that. Um, and then as far as the guided system for drone delivery routes, there'll be a software that we will be launching. But ultimately, right now, where the, the guided system at is, is more for package delivery for strategic supplies. Okay. You mentioned that um, a parachute recovery system is not just about deploying a parachute when there's a failure. How do you establish that communication with the drone? When do you deploy it and what constitutes a failure? Yeah, so the, the parachute then, recovery system yeah. is actually completely independent so, of the drone. So if the drone were to fail, you still need to have power for your parachute. So the way to think of the sequence of events is first is identify failure. So that's either with the automatic trigger or it's with a manual remote, it's a big red button. Then you wanna kill the power through the flight termination system. So again, you either interrupt the power between the battery and the drone, or you send a command through the flight controller to the uh, motors to stop spinning. Um, for the OSDK, for example, that's a kill command. And then you deploy the parachute. Um, so there's there's a couple right. sequence of events to ultimately deploy a parachute system. And so for example, when we work with drone manufacturers, they're directly involved with tuning the auto trigger and giving us feedback, supplying us with flight data, because ultimately they're gonna know their drone and they're gonna know their max angles better um, than than anyone else. And they'll have the data support it. And those are kind of some examples of how we make sure that the auto trigger is, is as robust as possible. Okay. And what kind of drones do you support? Uh, so right now we've worked on drones from one kilogram up to 80 kilograms. Uh, we've worked on vertical takeoff landing. Uh, we've worked on multi-rotors. Uh, right now in market, we've got products for the M200, the M300 for the retrofit solutions for, for, you know, for the DJI lines. We'll be launching the Mavic 3 we announced last month. We'll have a Mavic 3 in market um, by the end of Q2. That again, um, will support for flight over people compliance and flight termination system requirements. And then we work with different drone manufacturers. Um, I can't disclose all of them, but you know, for example, Workhorse, we did an ASTM perfect 45 out of 45 um, with them in April and, and they're doing things for drone delivery and, and surveying. Interesting, okay, great. So I suppose those are all of our questions that we have for today. Um, yeah, so uh, for anybody who's joining just now, if you have any more questions, you can visit uh, yeah the ABS's booth or you can email Josh, as you said. If you could repeat your email ID, please, for everybody. Yes, I'll put it right into the chat. So my email is josh.ogden at avss.co. Great. And he's also active on LinkedIn. Yeah, great. So he's also active on LinkedIn, I believe. And we can also they can also connect with you on over on LinkedIn. Yes, exactly. I'm very active on LinkedIn, right. spamming everybody. Right. Perfect. Well, thank you very much for having me and awesome. look forward to hearing from others. Great. Likewise. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye now. Bye.